Welcome students and fellow teachers who need to learn this really quick. Get ready for z-scores and percentiles. Parts of this video will have some calculations. While not required, it will be helpful to have a TI-84 calculator to follow along and maybe do some calculations together. For those of you who care about such things, you may pause this video when you need to and take some notes. We'll be doing this in three parts. Part one is review. At a minimum, you'll need to know how to find the average and sample standard deviation, and then you will see how to find a z-score. Part two, we will be looking at how a z-score relates to the normal distribution, also known as the bell curve. We will also see how z-scores and percentiles relate to the curve. In part three, we'll see how technology can be used to quickly move past the tedious calculations to let you focus on the problem solving. All right, moving on. So what does a z-score do that's so great? Answer, it tells us about where a data value stands among its peers, so to speak. The data in blue is a set of 24 pine tree diameters in inches. Yes, we still measure stuff in inches. Just go with it. The units aren't important. From this data, we can calculate the mean and sample standard deviation. Side note, if you're not sure how to find the sample standard deviation, many calculators have a built-in mechanism for finding it. On the T84, you'll find this under Stats, Submenu Calc, and then Execute the 1VAR Stats command. Okay, you've got data, you've found summary statistics, you've done the majority of the hard work. Finding a z-score is straightforward. Take any individual data point, subtract the mean, then divide by the standard deviation. Either you've already seen this or you will see this equation. It's only two operations, subtraction and division. Voila, you've computed a z-score. Typically, you will only be asked to find a single z-score for a single data item. But for the purposes of explaining, let's have a look at all the z-scores. Two things you should notice. The first is, about half are positive and half are negative. The second is they are all in this small sample between negative three and positive three. And the vast majority are between negative one and positive one. Let's highlight those in pink. These z-scores describe a data point that are somewhat close to the mean. In plain speak, they are quote unquote typical or ordinary and reflect an ordinary tree diameter size of the greater population. These z-scores and their associated data in yellow are what you'd call unusually large or small. This one is unusually large. And on the other extreme, this one here is unusually small. So in summary, z-scores help us identify unusual or otherwise interesting measurements. Let's take another kind of measurement, intelligence. Academics and psychologists use IQ scores for measuring intelligence. It's a given that the mean IQ score is 100 with a standard deviation of 15. If you take an IQ test and your score is 89, no need to worry. Your z-score is negative 0.73 and you're still considered normal intelligence. Likewise, if you have an IQ of 114, the z-score is 0.93. You're still within one standard deviation and considered normal. However, if your IQ score is 125, the z-score is 1.66. You're at the 95th percentile. Each little dot is a data point, and it's not obvious yet that 95% of the data is less than 125. When we have a lot more data and visually organize it in ascending order from small to big, what emerges is a graph with a definite shape. And in part two, we'll explore how z-scores and percentiles use this shape. Let's take a tour of the normal distribution curve, AKA the bell curve. It has some familiar parts. For one thing, it's symmetric about the y-axis. The curve has a maximum height at about 0.4, so it's somewhat short. The x-axis below will have zero in the center. And you can think of these numbers as z-scores. 
What we really care about most is the area under the line. The entire area is 1 or 100%. So this half is 50% and 75% looks like this. You'll want to know some key points of interest. You'll usually be asked to memorize these three. From negative 1 to positive 1, the area is 0.68. From negative 2 to positive 2, it's 0.95. And from negative 3 to positive 3, the area is 0.997. Mathematically, the left and right tails continue on forever, but they are so small as to become insignificant. Keep watching. In part 3, we'll see how to use technology to navigate around the curve. The beauty of the normal distribution is that you can easily express some complicated ideas into plain language. Returning to the IQ examples, an IQ of 100 has a z-score of 0 and sits exactly in the middle. Congratulations to that person. They are at 0.5 of the area, and that can be described as the 50th percentile. That's as normal as you can get. A person with an IQ of 83 has a z-score of negative 1.1333, and on the normal distribution, this corresponds to an area of 0.1285, which is approximately the 13th percentile. Side note, you can find a z-score table by searching the internet. You take the z-score and it tells you the area under the curve, starting from the left tail. Here's a fun fact. The US Air Force has a test that's roughly equivalent to an IQ test, and you need an IQ of 95 or better to be accepted. You can also use the normal curve for finding questions like this. How many people out of 1 million have an IQ above 160? Since that's the top 99.997th percentile, that's about 32 people. The T84 has several tools for working with normal distributions. And for the purpose of being direct and to the point, let's focus on two of them. Begin by pressing the blue second key, and then press the button labeled VARS. This will bring you to the submenu for working with distributions. The two tools we will look at are normal CDF and invnorm. Normal CDF, which means normal distribution continuous density function, will give you the area under the normal curve when given two points. For example, the area between negative 1 and positive 1 is entered like so. The T84 gives you a prompt for four parameters. In this example, we will assume a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Here's a second example. From the left tail to negative 1, you can enter negative 100 because you can't enter negative infinity, and it's far enough down the x-axis that it provides accurate enough results. The third example, you don't necessarily need to use 0 for mean and 1 for standard deviation. Using IQ scores, where we know the mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15, we can directly enter a given IQ score without needing to convert it into a z-score. What you're seeing here means a score of 122 is about the 93rd percentile. Compare this with if we converted 122 into its proper z-score, and the two answers seen here are accurate to three decimal places. The other tool is invnorm, which is an abbreviation for inverse normal. It takes as an input the area under the curve and returns the position along the x-axis. Example 1. Suppose you wanted to see the z-score of the bottom 10th percentile. You'd enter the parameters like so. Area is 0.1, mean is 0, and standard deviation is 1. Be sure the tail is on the left, paste it in, and press enter to execute the command. There you go, negative 1.28. Example 2. If we wanted to know the score for the top 10% of students who score on a test, knowing the class average is 80 with a standard deviation of 5, the top performers will have a score of 86 or above. Side note, this is what's called grading on a curve when teachers or instructors award grades using this technique. 
Example 3. Suppose you'd like to know the IQ of people who score at the 98th percentile. Just enter 0.98, 100 for the mean, and 15 for the standard deviation. The answer must be rounded up to 131 because IQ scores don't have decimals. That's everything. Thanks so much for watching. If this video was in any way helpful, you can help others find it by clicking the like button. I also have a website with lots of free goodies, including some programs that make learning statistics much easier.